Welcome to React Roundup. I'm your host, Jack Harrington. And with me today is Paige Niederinghouse. Hey, everyone. And TJ Ventol. Hey, everybody. And our guest for today is Florian, or Flo. We're going with the Flo. Hi, Florian. Hi. <laughs> so, Florian, what makes you famous and what brings you on React Roundup? I wouldn't say I'm famous. Uh, today, <laughs> I think I'm here does. to talk about Pyro, a uh, framework for microfinance. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I'm really excited about that. Hey, folks, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. And lately, I've been working on actually building out Top End Devs. If you're interested, you can go to topendevs.com slash podcast, and you can actually hear a little bit more about my story, about why I'm doing what I'm doing with Top End Devs, why I changed it from uh, devchat.tv to Top End Devs. But what I really want to get into is that I have decided that I'm going to build the platform that I always wished I had with devchat.tv and I renamed it to Top End Devs because I want to give you the resources that are going to help you to build the career that you want, right? So whether you want to be an influencer in tech, whether you want to go and just max out your salary and then go live a lifestyle with your family, your friends, or just traveling the world or whatever, I, I want to give you the resources that are going to help you do that. We're going to have career and leadership resources in there, and we're going to be giving you content on a regular basis to help you level up and max out your career. So go check it out at topendevs.com. If you sign up before my birthday, that's December 14th. If you sign up before my birthday, you can get 50% off the lifetime of your subscription. Once again, that's topendevs.com. So why, can you give us a little bit of intro? Assuming that, let's say, I don't know micro front ends or we don't know micro front ends. What is a micro front end and why shouldn't we use your micro front end framework? <laughs> Yeah, so microfinance is all about scalability, that you give actually multiple teams the option to just develop parts of one application and empower these teams, of course. So getting a little bit uh, of similar benefits that you do get with microservices on the back end that says anything to you. And uh, yeah, the challenge, of course, with micro frontends is how do you make the UI consistent? How do you actually bring together those pieces. And this is actually where Pyrel comes into play. So it's figured that all out from yeah, the development aspect up to this composition layer. And it brings together things that, well, other approaches have, of course, also solved, but of course, only solved, for instance, for a part of it. And so this is the whole story. <laughs> okay, so we think about a traditional web page, right? And we think about, like, there's the header, and maybe, you know, some content section. And maybe if you're an e-commerce site, there's the area where you might add something to the cart. What part, and maybe a carousel showing like different products or whatever, what part of that page would be, would you think would be a good micro front end? Of course, as mentioned, it's all about this uh, team split. So sure. what you would do if you take that example of your e-commerce application is that you would identify different subdomains of your of your site, right? And what has been proven successful, but it doesn't mean that it's the right approach now for your particular e-commerce site, right? Is that you, for instance, put everything related to the checkout uh, into one team's responsibility and everything regarding products in the hands of another team. And then you could have, for instance, a team that only cares about user accounts and maybe a fourth team that only cares about showing the right recommendations for this user, et cetera, et cetera. So, and if there are new features coming up, maybe it makes sense to scatter that uh, feature into different teams, maybe in one of the existing teams, maybe do to uh, create a new team uh, about that feature. And that's, of course, now architecture talk and uh, going oh, into now a specific it. application. But yeah, uh, in general, it, of course, gives you this ability to scatter that around and really have teams that take care of one of these subdomains. And they are really the domain experts, which is sure. the difference to monoliths, right? Where everyone, <laughs> of course, needs to have a head uh, on in, in all the aspects, at least to some degree. And that can be rather overwhelming, of course, at least in the big applications that I know of. <laughs> so maybe you can help me paint a picture. Let's suppose that we have a team that's devoted to like related products, We'll just say, right, mm -hmm. that's an e-commerce site. All they do is they try to, they write the algorithm for related products. That's their thing. So how would exactly a micro front end work, like in terms of like the high level code, right? Because I have my product page within my like React app or whatever, mm -hmm. and I need to bring in this micro front end that's just for related products. Like what would the, the sort of structure of that actually look like? Yeah, depending on the approach. So I, of course, will take the approach of Pyro. What you would do is think about uh, what you would do in React when you create, let's say, a component library. 
Now, a component library only takes care about, let's say, components that are rather generic. For instance, think about a button or maybe a generic panel, right? It doesn't know any any data where it comes from. It only knows, okay, there will be, for instance, in the button, there may, it will be maybe a label and someone will, uh, will potentially attach an event handler on clicking on this. But it doesn't know anything about the domain. Now, the micro frontend operates on a different level. You would still write just a component in there. And for instance, you would write a component like a carousel, right? It just shows you a kind of a product and maybe it has a kind of a header on top of the carousel and it says customers who uh, looked at the current product also were interested in, and then maybe in the carousel, right? All the other products are shown. But now it's a little bit more than the carousel, right? Because this carousel already deals with the data. So it needs to know where to get the, the data from. For instance, the backend, it knows, of course, the shape of that data and it, of course, then displays that data. So it already merged the data part together with a component that was domain independent and it will show you now a domain dependent component. So it really has all the domain knowledge in there and it, it just is this component. Now, of course, someone needs to, let's say, integrate this component that that team wrote. And in Pyro, the approach is rather simple. You create so-called extension slots. So these are points on, on the page or yeah, on some content that is owned by, by any team where they can say, oh, here, by the way, some other team can place something in there. And if that slot name is matched by now the uh, component offered by, for instance, this recommendation team, then suddenly in this slot, the recommendations are showing up. If no team is interested in bringing anything on that slot, nothing will show up, right? That's this decoupled approach that Pyro makes, for instance, unique. Other things you will always import explicitly, which is, of course, for tutorials, very nice. But in practice, will always break break because uh, what you have there is a feature overlap. And this is something you want to avoid also in microservice architectures, right? There's a good Lackmus test. If you can, can turn off some parts of your system and the system in general works and doesn't, you know, just uh, throw exceptions everywhere and goes down, <laughs> then it's a well-architectured system. And that's what, what Pyrel always tries to aspire. So it loosely covers everything that you can just go ahead and release, turn on, turn off, and the whole application will always keep on working. Right. So this team can independently, therefore, release, they can update, they can change contracts. And yeah, and the worst case that, that will happen is that the recommendations don't show up anymore, but uh, the applications <laughs> will never go down by the changes that this team is doing. So that actually is a great intro, I think, into asking you to tell us more about Pyro, because it, it's not a framework or a library that I'm familiar with. So I'd really like to hear more about how it it sounds like it takes a lot of the issues or some of the complexity of maintaining a lot of micro front ends and makes it a lot easier. Yeah, so Pyro was born out of, let's say, repetitive work that I did in, in architecture consulting. I think the first project I had in this space was around, let's say, 2015-ish. Uh, we did their smart uh, platform for, for smart home product. And there the issue was exactly that we had different teams. They were all dealing with different devices. And they wanted, of course, their device to show up in the UI, right? And maybe tomorrow a new team is onboarding and they also deal with a new device. And you want to show, of course, in, for instance, a settings page or on the dashboard, specialized control for this device. Uh, as an example, right, a Philips Hue is a, is a different kind of switch than you would expect from a standard light switch because it may have colors, for instance. And you want to have that, too, when you deal with that device on your dashboard. And so what we did there is that we created a kind of plugin architecture. Back then, of course, no one was talking about micro frontends. Uh, that, that just was then occurring theme or the, the terminology was born around 2016, 17-ish. But it was exactly that. So different teams are creating these kinds of uh, plugins, which were just libraries that were dynamically loaded, right? And over the next two, three years for yeah, different clients are made yeah, I would say rather a similar architecture. It wasn't clear from the beginning that the architecture would be the same, right? Because of course, clients come up with requirements and you say, mm -hmm, nice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> noted. Let's see what we can do here. <laughs> and then you start thinking about it. And in the end, you look at the sketched architecture and you say, wait a minute. <laughs> there are some similarities to the, to the project that beforehand, right? So what can I borrow here? And uh, mm -hmm. the story, of course, evolved a bit and uh, the implementation of the architecture refined, of course, with every iteration. 
And in 2019, I joined a new company and uh, there we thought, what should we do? And I said, microphone lens <laughs> is, is a good <laughs> thing to go. And what I want to do is actually this architecture that I now implemented four times <laughs> and each time a little bit better, try to make it generic that more people can, of course, use it, make it open source that really a community benefits and have the full story figured out, right? So have the full ecosystem, things that if you would just do a single, a single implementation, no one would, of course, invest in a browser extension or a VS Code extension or all these things which make a framework really, you know, live and, and quite awesome to use. No one would invest in that. Uh, of course, developer experience should always be high. But if you do an open source implementation and then really care about this thing, then, then you can make something that from the ecosystem perspective is really complete. And that is what we, what we tried with Pyro. And I think we, um, of course, we are not the largest solution because microfrontends itself is, you know, rather specialized. And we aim really towards the, let's say, the users that have a lot of microfrontends. So the largest customer we have, uh, at, so knowing customer, right? Not open source user, but really we, we are doing also consultant. Consulting here is having around uh, 140 microfrontends here. So that's mm. a really a large number, wow. right? Of course, not every every user gets the 140. I think on average, it's about 30 to 40-ish uh, what, what a standard user gets, but they have this large number. Um, and so they support all the use cases. And if I would tell you about their solution, I mean, it's a portal. Um, that's a little bit where the name also comes from. Pyro is a little bit like portal, right? And it's a customer portal and they have different business segments. And depending on what kind of user you are, you are in a different uh yeah, associated with a different segment of, of the offerings, right? And so, of course, you get different microfrontends because someone who is interested uh, in their, I don't know, microscopy segment will get different things than if you would be interested in, in, in semiconductors. And some things may be the same, I don't know, like the feedback microfrontend where you can give feedback to the portal itself, that will yeah. always be the same, right? But there are really a lot of, of things that will be just tailored for the end user. And that is, again, one of the great use cases, in my opinion, because really that's just composed on the fly. Uh, no one is saying, <laughs> oh, there's an if now, and if it's that user, we now need to load this code. No, it's not like that. Uh, each microphone has a feature flag. And so depending on what kind of user you are, different microphones are provisioned for you. And that's a very dynamic system. And it wouldn't scale, of course, if it wouldn't be loosely coupled, if it would be loose, uh, would, wouldn't be loosely coupled, right? So that's a little bit the background story and uh, where we are today. So, I mean, today, I think at least in microphone and segment, we are known to some degree, but definitely not the most popular solution, but I think uh, a solid one. So who would be some competitors in this space? I mean, would Single Spa be a competitor with you guys? Yeah, I mean, uh, let's say from Mindshare, definitely. They are, of course, uh, always, let's say, a factor 10 larger, which is fine for us. Of course, we would uh, also wouldn't mind uh, getting getting some of that fraction here. But at the end of the day, I mean, they're also doing a great job. They are just uh, for everyone who doesn't know what Single Spa is. It's uh, a little library that could be considered a meta router. So they take care of having your routes managed. And depending on your routes, you load different micro frontends there. And the big advantage of single spa, or let's say what they brought in first was uh, that you can happily use different frameworks, which of course is one of the often announced advantages of micro frontends. I always say a good micro frontend framework needs to do that, but it shouldn't fully embrace that because at the end of the day, <laughs> you may want to do that. But if all you want to say, oh, we have such a great application because we use the most front end frameworks in it that may not be, may not be the selling point of it, right? Uh, every, every additional framework makes your, your things, let's say, uh, slower, at least uh, from bandwidth consumption also, but also memory consumption in the browser. And at the end of the day, developer experience may also not be the best because yes, it's great that this one, other team you have is now experimenting with this front end framework that came out yesterday, but someone <laughs> needs to maintain the code, right? And it's, yeah. uh, if the team goes away and no one knows what to do with that code, yes, you can argue micro front ends is great because you can just throw it away and start the new thing here because they're <laughs> just so small. But on the other hand, it's also not much fun, right? Just to do things because you lack knowledge in, in for instance, the, the framework that was used. Yeah. I think that the practical aspect here is that, like, let's say you have an Angular app. And you want to start moving over to React. This would allow you to like something like Single Spot would allow you to port pieces yes. of the page as opposed to say port an entire page across, yes. which is 
pretty pretty standard. So I mean, yeah, you're right. You don't want to use you know random framework X just because it's there. You know, you you are going to be downloading an entire like view runtime onto the page. Yes. Yes. In addition to React or whatever. And that's not great. So, yeah, I mean, obviously use with care, as with all this stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah that was going to be one of my questions because in the past, the term portal with me has not had a positive connotation, I would say, <laughs> to say the least. Like, when yeah. you think those big, like, enterprise-y portals where a bunch of things, they're pretty usually awful experiences. And I, I think, like, the main reason they are is because they're just loading in a ton of crap because they're bringing in all sorts of stuff from all sorts of different systems and they don't share anything. So they're just completely almost loading like full web pages in little boxes. So that this leads into my, my question is, what do you try to do to avoid that? Like, is there, can your micro front end like share dependencies? Because like, I wouldn't want my little micro front ends each to individually ro- like load their own version of React, right? Like, because that seems very wasteful so i'm curious what's your yeah like what is your approach for dealing with with that sort of scenario yes so true one of the things that uh, a front-end framework needs to do is share dependencies of course there was always a huge debate right especially for people coming from the back end where they they have really this this share nothing attitude <laughs> or oh, you share now dependencies but yeah on the front end you need to do it because as as you said i mean it's it's different than on the back end it's not like different things now running on on different machines and you can just scale up if you say oh this one service is now slow for some reason or just give it more more memory there you deal with with <laughs> mobile phones and maybe someone renders your page in a raspberry pi or whatnot right and it just <laughs> needs to work so you really want to deliver the smallest bundle size possible despite micro front ends and yes uh, pyro also does that of course there, there are various mechanisms out of the box pyro uses for instance system js and uh, makes that rather easy because uh, in system jazz you can yeah just share things and you can even share them you know with with uh Semver ranges and all of that which is quite great so you can say oh keep react if it satisfies i don't know 17.x and so we were just looking that up and uh so things that you would otherwise do, and that's the other mechanism, you can use module federation, for instance. The problem with module federation is, uh, which is why we don't, uh, let's say, uh, enforce it to the users, it gets you into the Webpack ecosystem. And you need to do that, not only then on your application shell, your main application, but also with with, uh, with each microphone, and right? So in order to really uh, leverage that, you need to have Webpack 5, which is one of the options you can use with Pyro. You can use any bundle. Right now, out of the box, we support ES Build. Webpack, any version, right? Four and five, we have official ports, parcel version one, version two, white, roll up, you name it, right? They all just work and they work with dependency sharing, all of that, which is quite great because you get then the least bundle size and you can do all, all those, those tricks you can do with, with model federation. On the other hand, of course, what I also want to throw in, just also because I gave a talk on that, uh, dependency management is, of course, one, one side, the tooling that enables that, like, Let's, let's take a module federation, which is great. But on the other hand, you still need to understand the libraries that you want to share because there are some libraries that you may, may not even need to or want to share them for whatever reason. They are really good, tree shakeable, et cetera. And they don't have any global. So yeah, just use these fragments that they come with. That's, it's all good. And then there are maybe libraries which have, you know, global objects somewhere and they would conflict if you would just load them in twice. So that, that wouldn't be good. Style components may be a good example because they hash the style sheets and they use a global for that. That may have changed in one of the recent versions, but at least a year ago, it was still an issue. So you needed to, to share style components. It wouldn't have worked if you would have, you know, swam to micro front ends. And they bring their own version of style components that would have conflicted. And another good example is React. Uh, React uh, doesn't have a global, but it has what I call a singleton. And that's a dispatcher. The problem is you see that already if you have even non micro front end solution, but you bundle for whatever reason React uh, in there twice, right? And there you see it doesn't work in the same render tree. The thing is that it needs to know for the hooks to work, the, the dispatcher that's set by React DOM. And if you have two versions of React in there, only one version gets set, right? <laughs> and so when components from, that are bundled with the other instance of React rendered, uh, this patcher is still undefined and the thing crashes. 
And so you would always need to respawn a new uh, render tree that is consistent there. But then again, we are back at knowing the internals of these libraries, at least to some degree, and understanding that, right? So there are some decision-making aspects here, like what's the size of the library, et cetera, et cetera, that, that will end up with you deciding, is it worth sharing the library or not? But in general, you, you want to share it, right? Yeah. Hey, folks, I'm here with JD from Raygun. JD, I, I have to complain. I mean, when I started in tech like 20 years ago, one of the first things they taught me was to use tail and gref to find the problem on a server. and uh, uh, I, I don't do that anymore. Um, I have to say Raygun kind of solves that problem for me and picks up all the stuff that really is relevant to the request or whatever that hat came in. Um, I'm curious, do you find that with kind of the oldsters like me, a common thing? or I think there's definitely better approaches to solving some of these problems now. You know, <laughs> I, I always used to think of logging. I heard this great analogy once. It was like, you know, logging tools are like coffins. Things go in there. They very rarely come out, you know, um, and you feel safe because it's there, but there's so much noise. Understanding what's mm-hmm. important and what's not takes a lot of effort. Um, yeah. And I mean, you know, often I talk about Raygun's crash reporting product as being like a black box flight recorder. Like, just tell me when the plane blows up because I need to fix that really urgently, <laughs> You know, um, and that's been hugely valuable. And you don't need to tail that. That's true. You know, folks, you should just go get ray gun and then you can see when stuff breaks, what matters. You can get it at raygun.com. They actually are doing a free trial. So go check it out. Well, I just have a question of how easy or difficult is it to to make something into a micro front end architecture that uses Pyro? Because you've talked a lot about how when you start out gathering client requirements and putting together an architecture, you know, it it seems like a pretty good idea. But if you're building one of those applications that just kind of starts mushrooming, as many of them do, you know, is there a certain point where you realize, hey, we really should not continue to build this my this monolithic application, but we should split it into micro front ends? And is that something that can be done? Or is it really like, oh, we need to just rebuild this from the ground up with that idea in mind yeah so i mean if uh, let's say really starting at zero and and making the decision microphone or not i mean it all depends of course on the envision size of that application if you say we are making let's say a simple landing page for something and you know we we'll work a week on it and maybe we we'll then update maybe a little bit of the styling or add a, a little bit of content here or there micro front end architectures of course <laughs> like shooting oh, with a bazooka on, on a, <laughs> a tiny bug uh, it's it's uh, really out of the question but of course then uh, let's say we, we take going back to that e-commerce side would micro front ends make sense here right e-commerce of course are always a very very good example to to also show the domain decomposition and then how you could assign different teams. But at the end of the day, of course, it's the same uh, story. I mean, for instance, if you take an out-of-the-box e-commerce solution and you now as the vendor, you only care about selling, I don't know, T-shirts, uh, selling T-shirts, then uh, yeah, maybe you sh- and you don't even have, I don't know, a development team or just you know, the smallest team to, to set up that site, then of course, microphones are not for you. But of course, if you're now one of these vendors who, you know, in Germany, we have, for instance, Salando, if you heard of them, they're also one of the, the pioneers in that uh, space. They made a server side composition solution quite early on called Mosaic. And they really care about their tech. And so they're really tech driven. And uh, what they have is they have different teams already. So they, they are already prepared from the organization point of view to work in that mode, then of course it makes a lot of sense for them to start already with microphones because they already empowered all these teams. Why now move it <laughs> back to, to one monolith? On the other hand, of course, if you at the moment have an organizational structure that only supports a monolith, it will be very hard to move to do both, right? On the technical side, move to microphones, but on the other side, I mean, empower these teams. Because at the end of the day, the, the worst thing you can create with, I mean, it's not specific to microphone, it's the same for microservices, is a hidden monolith where, well, you have now technically all these things floating around, but they require so much alignment and so much, you know, overhead in the organizational point of view 
it's not worth it. So don't go there. Make sure first that you really can have these independent pieces. And I mean, with Pyrel, of course, what you can do and what I usually recommend when people say, yeah, we, we identified that we, we may be ready. And I say, okay, good. Don't put too much in, in, in micro frontends from the beginning. Yes, I said that example with the 140 micro frontends. But if you don't know yet, if there's a certain thing now in your application, don't know yet that it should be in this one team or so, or you know that it changes often. Just leave it in the application shell. Leave it in that, that same monolith underneath that still wires together these different pieces. You can later on still put it in a micro frontend. One example, I mean, I mentioned that this, um, for instance, the feedback micro frontend in, in the larger portal solution, that was in the beginning in this monolith, monolithic layer, right? And it was good there. It stayed the same for, I don't know, half a year, almost a year. And then suddenly they came up with requirements for that. They said, oh, Oh, wait a minute. We now want to have different layout here and a different question if the user gave before in that answer. <laughs> and we say, okay, great. Maybe that's a good point now to move it out because I have a feeling <laughs> now that you started with requirements so that there will be more incoming. And so we put it in a, in a, in a micro front end and that was good because a week later after the deployment, they came up again with some requirements and suddenly from that on, right, each month you can, can count the clock. <laughs> it's there. They, they make new requirements. And so mm -hmm. this thing moves now at its own pace and that's good. They can just update it independently. It doesn't require a full application rebuild or anything, right? I mean, it's just the application shell, but still. And so it was moved out, but it, they didn't start right away with that. And that's the, the crucial point, right? Don't start already with all the complexity and start already with a list of, of I don't know, we identified these 200 micro frontends that make sense, but mm -hmm. really just first see, does it make sense? Is there a team already? Or should we first start with it in this application shell layer? And then when we, when we get some advantage, because, you know, it's moving at its own pace, there are more updates here and coming, maybe then move it out, right? And it makes sense. And that's great that you can move, yeah, cut it as you want it in, according to your needs. So, so okay, is there, is there a nice half step here with this? I mean, we talked about this before we got on, on, on the air about I, the islands architecture. Is that a, is that, how does that relate to this? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's island architecture, the thing that now becomes more and more popular with, I would say, this new hype of frameworks. I mean, I know 10 years ago, people were always joking about, oh, while the talk is happening, a new JavaScript framework was born. But uh, frankly, then in the last two or three years, not so much happened. Yes, of course, some frameworks came up, but also things that we consider maybe hot these days, like Svelte, for instance. I love Svelte. It's great. Or SolidJS. They have also been born already four or five years ago. They just now get some traction. But now in the last, I think, since Remix, uh, Remix was, was there, we, we've seen uh, this growth of frameworks again, partially, of course, as I wouldn't call it PR stunts, but of course, nicely together like Dino is there for a while now and uh, didn't get so much traction I think as they hoped it's uh, I think maybe too a radical move but anyway uh, <laughs> it's cool technology but it of course it has the burden of starting without a, an ecosystem right against something with ecosystem always difficult anyways let's now try to to get it from the other side right and they came up with fresh but maybe that fresh is now burned through bun because now there's a different <laughs> runtime at the end that's compatible to Node.js. Uh, anyway <laughs> so there is now the, all this this let's say new movement of frameworks and i love that because I mean, at the end of the day it really doesn't matter which one is uh, let's say the winner or is there a winner but there are new ideas in here and new approaches. And I think in the end, everyone will, will win through that, right? So we will all advance with a little bit more knowledge. And one of the things these new frameworks, of course, try to do is, uh, yeah, make, serve, make it as fast as possible. So performance is what they, they uh, always claim is, is their, their key part. And to do that, of course, it needs to be somewhat pre-rendered, server-side rendered, uh, you name it. So don't ship too much JavaScript to the browser. And to really uh, make still interactivity work, you still want this hydration mode, right? Where you say, oh, I delivered pretty much everything pre-rendered, but now this one button that I don't know, just counts something, <laughs> that now suddenly works also in the client, right? And the problem with React is on pretty much all established frameworks, they usually require the full information to be resumed again or to hydrate. So in, in React, you may have created, I don't know, a state container that you use and you may touch other things. You have maybe style components and now you render now a different, uh, yeah, or the same component, but with a different style. But in order to know all that, you need to have all the code now in the browser again. So 
if you want to hydrate, you pretty much hydrate the full thing again. That's one of the issues, of course, that Next.js always faces. And they also try always to come up with something cool and new. <laughs> and this is where, the, where this island architecture is often the new. So what they are after is that you only need to hydrate now a certain island in your inner site, an island of interactivity, let's say. And you will provide the minimalistic JavaScript to make this little island work, right? So if the little island didn't require, for instance, your state container or didn't need to know about state components, why should all these things be, be loaded for this little island to be, be active, right? And uh, one of the, the cool frameworks that brought up this concept of resumability is Quick. And yeah, Quick is uh, <laughs> one of the frameworks from Builder.io. So they came up with a lot of cool JavaScript. I love, for instance, PartyTown. Uh, anyone who's listening who didn't check that out, check it out <laughs> because it's, it's a cool solution for, let's say, isolate third-party scripts. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, so what Quick is about is really having your state always serializable and making it therefore fully resumable, pausable, and really just transport in the little fragments that really are needed for your interactivity part, right? So it really embraces island architecture. And other, of course, frameworks also try similar things. For instance, we have Astro, uh, static site generator that yeah, tries to play happily with other frameworks. And they also then say, well, in this, I have some kind of an island, but yeah, if the island is React, <laughs> it still transports the whole React uh, part in there, right? So it's not full island. I don't think at this point, full island, meaning uh, across any kind of framework is, is really figured out. But all these frameworks that try to come up with some kind of island architecture and uh, fresh and uh, quick at the moment, I think, to, to really the process in that regard. So it's always about this island of interactivity. And yeah, part of it certainly goes a little bit in the direction of micro frontends because there you could also say, oh yeah, if, if I, let's say I compose my website. Uh, now I have, of course, these components coming from different parts, right? From different teams, from these different micro frontends. Are they the same then? Are these also islands? And I would say in some regard, yes. But in another regard, no, right? Because the micro frontend thing is really about the domains, whereas the island architecture is about this interactivity. But yeah, they can, of course, there's an intersection. <laughs> and that's, I think, uh, maybe the, the sweet spot here, right? If you hit that, you have uh, what I would call maximum performance <laughs> and yeah, maximum scalability. But achieving that, of course, is at least at this point difficult yeah. with what we have. So I have a question about workflow. And it's when you have, like, let's suppose we're in one of these companies that has 30, 40 micro front ends deployed. Are the micro front ends able to update themselves like automatically outside of the main app like if i work on the carousel team can i is it common to let people push that carousel like to production without the main app or is the main app always in control like is the main app saying okay there's a new version of the carousel so let me update to the new version and push it live and what workflow do people use what for workflow makes sense i'm kind of curious what what you've seen works for that sort of thing yeah i mean the most successful workflow is definitely just you know, empower the teams, let them publish. But I mean, we have, for instance, uh, some solutions in the healthcare uh, space. And if these interest industries are one thing, they are rather conservative. So even though they said, yeah. right, that makes sense to have this architecture and we believe in that and we want to have these different pieces because, you know, we ship to, to, into this region and there are uh, the following, let's say, functionality needs to be available and they're created by these teams and we ship into a different region and there it's a different set of functionalities, maybe created by different teams. They still want to control, of course, what is shipped exactly. So they don't just say to a team, just push. It's, it will be fine, right? It will go through regulatory, not an issue here. They will always say, are the documents ready? Have uh, quality management signed off on this? Uh, well, I need to see that. Yeah. So, of course, uh, to, I don't know, a development environment, that's all not a problem. But once it comes into production environments, especially in those industries that are regulated, it becomes, of course, process driven again, which is not something I like. And my personal opinion is always that it's a little bit fear because I think I'm not saying they're wrong with regulatory. So they, there are these regulations and they need to follow it. I'm just saying they sometimes, if it's on the boundary, is this a thing that needs to be, you know, fall into regulatory aspects? And they're not sure about it. They always say, okay, it's regulated. So we need to have processes on this. And if you then argue, well, but that's the, the front end part, right? It's not 
the crucial thing. The crucial thing is where the data is handled and everything that that's correctly handled. There's no discussion for these guys. And <laughs> so, uh, but that's a personal opinion. Again, uh, the, the, the most, let's say, powerful aspect is when teams can just go ahead. And this is, for instance, this, again, referencing that one with the, a lot of microphones that wouldn't work, of course, if there would be someone there cherry picking or the application and determining what's there for microphone lens, right? Uh, that only works really if a microphone and can be created just by a team that now says, oh, we need a, we need a front end for it. And they just create it. Uh, there's no interaction needed with the full application. They can just push it and uh, then it's, it's online, right? So, and for that, of course, the organization needs to trust their teams that they can just create new things and can publish it and uh, that they are empowered. But again, that's, I think, one of the aspects that comes with going micro anything because <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you don't empower your teams, then as mentioned, well, in the end, you just get more complexity with that. So yeah. you need to empower yep. them. And at this point, it's really, yeah, I think maybe you could say if you go micro something, then you stop micromanaging because at this point, really, the team <laughs> should manage themselves, right? So you do microservice that you don't need to do micromanagement. And it's the same, of course, with that. Yeah. It's a great tagline. <laughs> yeah. What? And honestly, it sounds like a decision, like it probably could help you decide too, because all of us here on this call have worked at companies like the one you're describing. And like, I could see being very hesitant to adopt this sort of approach. So it's probably something that if you're considering this for like a large organization, something to keep in mind, whether you can actually fully take advantage of the the architecture or not. Yeah, it's sometimes it's a little bit hard to know from the beginning. Uh, I mean, some of the projects we are in, they always, they, they started promising, right? They come to us and say, oh, we evaluated different approaches, different frameworks, different architectures. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we think Pyro might be the best fit. So they, they tell us what they want to do. We have this problem and then we look at it and say, oh, yeah, I mean, it, it really fits. Then you're in this project and you start, well, it's so all seems to be working. And then at some point in time, you hear from someone you've never heard of beforehand oh but by the way this thing also needs to be covered and you say ah, okay it's not ideal but let's do it but then at some point right you realize well i mean there are now more and more of these these requirements coming in and yeah up to the point i mean not in all projects but some really end up like that where you say okay i mean now it, it's really getting crazy right if you would have known all it from the start just state your monolith but because now you're just making things complex for no reason, right? And, and you bring yeah. in, again, all these processes that require all this alignment. That was not the deal, right? <laughs> Sometimes they hear, but many times it's just, no, no, but we wanted that. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult, right? It's an organizational problem. And uh, this is where, let's say, their dream of going micro something then clashes uh, with uh, really some, some <laughs> middle yeah. class or, or uh, <laughs> more top manager suddenly realizing that, oh, we're losing control here of this thing. And that's, of course, something that maybe distinguishes really great companies from companies that are mm, yeah, maybe doing all right still, <laughs> maybe because of the industry, maybe for, I don't know, whatever reason. But yeah, hopefully they also will change at some point in time or they will be, let's say, beaten by the companies that, that learned that lesson, right? It's, it's, uh, I know a lot of, uh, especially in Germany, we have a lot of these companies, especially in the car industry, right? I mean, they are successful just what they are doing. And that's why they believe what they're doing is right. And, uh, even though they, they recognize, for instance, there's a problem, they will just change in the last second. Really, when, 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 when it hits the fan, right? <laughs> um, then, uh, they will, they will say, Oh, now we need to do something. Let's just create some new sub company with, with new minds and they will just figure out all our problems. And then when they figured it out, we bring them back into our organizational structure. That's what they usually do. And unfortunately, they are still successful with that. I mean, or fortunately, you can say, of course, happy that all of the people keep their jobs there, but they could do so much better, right? <laughs> <laughs> if they would just let go, because they, they have usually really good people working there, which mm -hmm. always surprises me. But it's not the people. The people are not the problem there. It's really organizational issue. It's a management issue at the end. Yeah, you have to be completely bought in to, at every not just the engineers, but also product managers and engineering managers. And everybody has to be bought in to micro front yes. ends. And you have to, because there is a price, right? And, and you have to be able to realize that price, right? If you, if you have a micro front ends architecture and they don't use it or whatever you use, it, yeah, it's just not great. So yeah. is there anything that we've, we've missed in our conversation here before we wrap up and go to our pick segment? Not from my side. 
Um, Not from your side. Questions, though? of course. <laughs> I, I, well, I would be curious if people want to get started. What's the best place? Oh, yeah. Like, where where should That's we send cool. them? Like, are there any tutorials you'd recommend? Like, what people that are interested, what should they what should they do? Where should they go? Yeah, yeah. Our page is pyro.io. Pyro is written like pi, the you know uh, natural number, <laughs> R A L pyro.io. There you find a documentation page that has huge list of tutorials, right? Guiding you from, you know, uh, creating your first app shell, creating micro frontends, updating these things. And there's the concepts that, uh, that are involved in there, which make Pyle unique. Like for instance, the emulator, which is, I think, a quite cool approach because it lets you just develop micro frontends without having to, you know, somewhat taking care of to, hey, I need that app shell. I need to run that micro frontend now in some context. Uh, it just makes all that for you. It's a one stop uh, happy solution and uh, it guides you through all of these things. And I think that would be the best place to go. Also, of course, there we have a lot of reference materials, some articles out there, etc. And I think that's the one stop that you should use if you're interested in at least checking out Pyro. All these tutorials, by the way, are also available on, on YouTube. So yeah. each each oh, page cool. has, a, has a video, has the same content. If you prefer video instead of, of reading and want to see it instead of, you know, digesting yourself, that's, that's the fine approach and you can just follow it there too. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Hi, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs, and lately I've been coaching some people on starting some podcasts and, in some cases, just taking their career to the next level. You know, whether you're beginner going to intermediate, intermediate going to advanced, whether you're trying to get noticed in the community or go freelance, I've been helping these folks figure out how to get in front of people, how to build relationships, and how to build their careers and max out and, and just go to the next level. So if you're interested in talking to me and having me help you go to the next level, go to topendevs.com slash coaching. I will give you a one hour free session where we can figure out what you're trying to do, where you're trying to go and figure out what the next steps are. And then from there, we can figure out how to get you to the place you want to go. So once again, that's topendevs.com slash coaching. All right. Well, sounds like we're going to jump into some picks. Sounds like fun. Paige, you want to start us off? Sure. So my pick for this week is going to be an add-on if you have a smoker or some kind of a, a barbecue grill, and it's called the Grill Grate. It's something that my husband recently asked for for his birthday. And basically, you put it on top of your smoker and it heats up even further so that you can use it as a regular grill as well. So you can sear sear meat and it just makes it even hotter. So the, the, you know, the idea of the smoker is low and slow kind of cooking. But if you want to try and be able to do both with your smoker and have it also function as a grill, this makes it possible. And you just put it on half, it fits over like half the grill or something. And then it just heats up even further. So we haven't tried it out very much yet, but the few times that we have, it's done steaks really well. So mm. if you, yeah. <laughs> Nice. So if you're looking for something like this, where you just want to have one piece of outdoor cooking equipment, but you want to get both the best of the smoker and a grill, I would definitely say this is a good one to look into because it's it's relatively inexpensive compared to a brand new one. And uh, it'll save you a lot of space. So that's my going to be my pick for this week. Delicious. I love how when, when we're in North American or North uh, Hemisphere summer, like we, we, we become half react and half like grilling outdoor, know. you know, show. It's awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, TJ, what's yours this week? So I'm going to pick Stranger Things, which is ah. a pretty popular show. I think most people have seen it before. But if you have not, I thought the last season was quite good. Definitely worth watching. It's a bit long. Yeah, you have to like, we had a we had a weekend without the, the kids here and we just marathoned it. And it was quite the marathon, but it was it was good. It was enjoyable. So if you haven't checked out the last season season yet, I'd recommend it. Yeah, that, that we, we tried the first episode and I'm like, there are so many characters now. There's like, I, I can't. Yes. I really, I wanted like a guy that was like, who, wait, who is this person? Like, that's, and they're all That's older. actually, I think the show's, that's actually the show's biggest problem. I, I feel like there's a few that they could like cast off the island yeah. at this point, to like just to keep it a little yeah. more trimmed, trimmed down. Because some of them too, the plots seem to like, they had these kind of pointless plots just to make the character feel like they're still doing something. And I don't know. But like the overall, Hobbit. I still enjoyed it. I mean, it's it, just so. too many dang hobbits. Like, just, yeah. just <laughs> get, get, get us down to like three and a monster. <laughs> All right. Flo, you, you want to give us a pick? 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, I also want to say Stranger Things, and especially because I didn't, let's say, watch that. I started, I think, three weeks ago. So my wife was always recommending it to me. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know why I didn't check it out earlier. I know I heard it a few years ago, but I never checked it out. And then I just binged it. It was was great. Uh, I really just went over <laughs> it. And then luckily, they just released us the last two episodes of, of season four. And I got to agree, it was really lengthy. I mean, the last episode, and I looked 150 minutes or something like that. I was like, holy shit, that's, that's a, I mean, it's more than a movie, right? It's a, yeah. uh, back in the days when I was young, you had to pay extra on the cinema if a movie was beyond two hours, right? And oh, really? That was, yeah, you had to, oh, right? Germany, so, man. Yeah, uh, Germany, mm. right? It's uh, you got to pay here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is two hours, five minutes. You gotta pay now two euros more. So it was really the case. And it's crazy, right? I mean, not so long ago, we also had to pay extra for 3D. Now 3D is, I think, just gone. Oh, yeah. Maybe it comes back with, uh, you know, Avatar 2 or something. Oh, uh, <laughs> but who knows? I mean, Avatar was maybe, maybe best example. But I'm getting <laughs> off topic here. Uh, so recommendation. Yeah. So tech wise, I would say bun. If it wasn't mentioned ah, yet on the show, uh, sorry, I recommend that. took it Dang away. It. Yeah. I mean, it's still really early, but I'm so excited. I uh, wasn't excited about the tech like that since a while ago because, yeah, in my opinion, it's maybe the right, wouldn't call it success, a successor, but maybe follow up after Node.js, right? That's uh, just some things right. And it really embraces still the ecosystem, which is great. And therefore, it may have higher adoption than dinner. So just check that out and uh, give them a star because that always encourages further development but I think they are anyway so hyped right now because everyone's there's a lot of hype around it. yeah sure. it's so much hype already so I yeah. don't think it can get even bigger than that so <laughs> if you still have some hype left then put it on pyro <laughs> by the way anyway <laughs> so now uh, non-tech or maybe half tech recommendation would be a book, The God Equation, Michio Kaku, uh, one of my favorites, uh, science writers. And since I have a background in physics, I always love reading about such things. And yeah, it's a great book. If you're interested a little bit in particle physics and a lot into, you know, uh, science, uh, what we achieved the last 100, 150 years and where we might be heading here. It's, it's a, a good read, I would say. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, I will recommend something we've already talked about on this episode, and that's fresh, which I guess you could line up against fun in a way, because it, but it is based on Deno. Anyway, it is a new, it's a, it's a new frame, web framework, but based on Preact. So it, it, if you are familiar with Next, it'll feel very common, you know, it'll feel very easy for you to get into. But holy moly, is it fast. And it, it, creates very fast pages. It deploys very fast if you use Deno Deploy. And it really fully embraces this islands architecture that we talked about for a hot second there. And that can make for very fast pages as well because you're basically spotting the, the pieces of the page that require interact interactivity and not downloading all the rest of it. And so you're very, very fast, even for interactive pages. So... Yeah. All right. Yeah, this has been this has been great. Thank you, Flo, for showing up. And what a great talk. Thanks for having me. It was a yeah, pleasure. Our pleasure. Cool. All right. <laughs> well, we'll see you all next week. Bye. 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 Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.